made the whole thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a lot of work to do for something like that. But it really does capture the essence of the partner's tail. Now, I'm going to go out of a limb here and say that most likely no one in here has seen the movie A Simple Plan. Okay, it is on Netflix, and I'm going to say watch it. It's not an assignment. It's a really good movie, and it is a playing out of the partner's tale. Really good. Bill Paxton is in it. Wait, a simple plan? A simple plan. And who's the other guy? Uh, Billy Bob Thornton is in it. Yeah. And let's just say, simple plans always go wrong. But there's something about the partner's tale that is very alluring like that. And it originates with Chaucer in terms of this. You have this moralizing tale, but then you also have tales like, I said, the Miller's Tale, which is body and crude and crass. You have stories like the Knight's Tale, which is very long, drawn out, fairly boring, and it's about chivalry and what one should really do and all these sorts of things. The story of Canterbury Tales is a collection of stories, a collection that was never finished, but it remains a very important work from this time period. So what we're going to do is this. I want to touch upon some of the major things that we've discussed so far, but in doing so, I want to give you a few more important dates to make note of and, and people from this time period. And I'm going to start with the person that they are journeying to go see. The Canterbury Tales is a tale of them going on a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage to see a particular person. And that person died in 1170. Thomas Beckett who was murdered in Canterbury Cathedral. There's a really interesting story behind his murder, but one that I want you to look up on your own. Um, there are several different versions of it. But he was murdered, Thomas Beckett, it's B-E-C-K-E-T. He was murdered, and as a result, people would journey on pilgrimages to go see his shrine, which is an important aspect here. The dates for the Hundred Years' War are as follows. Doesn't quite add up to 100 years, but you get the point. The 100 Years' War, and then right around 1350. It's really probably closer to 1348, but this is where you have the Black Death. These are the key things to put in the timeline leading up to the end of the Middle English time period. And ultimately, the things that are going to bring about our major changes with the Renaissance. Now, once you hit the Renaissance time period, this is where we get into our works like Shakespeare, leading into our works like Milton, and things like that. So what we're reading is everything leading up to that point. I want to read you one quote that probably won't mean much to you right now, but it's a great quote explaining Beowulf and its time period. It says this, Christian writers, like the Beowulf poet, were fascinated by the distant culture of their pagan ancestors and by the inherent conflict between the heroic code and a religion that teaches that we should forgive those who trespass against us and that all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. The Beowulf poetry looks back on that ancient world with admiration for the courage of which it was capable and at the same time, with elegiac sympathy for its inevitable doom. Think about the end of Beowulf. Beowulf dies fighting the dragon. Where was he wounded? In the neck. He bleeds out, he dies. The people spend ten days preparing his funeral. And at his funeral, as they scan the horizon, what do they see in the distance? Final lines, they say this. Then the people begin to construct a mound on a headland, high and imposing, a marker that sailors, that sailors could see from far away, and in ten days they had done the work. It was their hero's memorial. What remained from the fire, they housed inside it, behind a wall as worthy of him as their workmanship could make it. He goes on to talk about the greatness, the praise, and everything. 
And then it said, They said that of all the kings upon the earth, he was the man most gracious and fair-minded, kindest to his people, and keenest to win fame. They're lamenting. They're praising. But there's this idea that in the background, there are invading tribes, invading places, and their hero that they're lamenting will not be here to protect them. Think about the people that Beowulf takes on his journey. Only one of them is true in the end, and that's Wiglaf. All of the others are weak. They cannot keep up with it. They, they don't go into the fight. So the fate of Beowulf's people is not looking that great. Just like this age of heroes did not last, bringing in this middle age time period. What I'm going to do is go ahead and ask you a few questions over some of the things that we've looked at today and see how well you do. Then we're going to end by explaining what next week brings. So, close up any notes you have. I want to see if you can get any of this right. Shout out the answers if you know them. Let's start with this. Correct definition for metonymy. Who's got it? Two words out of four. No. No, it's something that uh, replaces a word by being associated with it. Good. Give me an example of metonymy. Take top. Take top. Give me another word. The Oval Office. Good. The Oval Office is metonymy because you're talking about the entire White House or the entire executive branch as simply an office. Do you think of any others? Where you refer to something as its part? There's a poem by Shakespeare that talks about how the cuckoo, which is a bird, offends the married ear. And he's specifically talking about married men, because it sounds like the word cuckold, which means that your wife cheated on you. And so it says the married ear, referring to one part of a whole person. All hands on deck. Obviously, they're not asking for you to throw your hands down onto the deck. Do you remember in Robin Hood Men in Tights, when he says, uh, lend me your ears? and they throw their ears on the stage. I like that. That's quite good. All that's metonymy. Give me an example from Beowulf of a kenning. Battle spot. Good. What's another one? Heather uh, Stepper. Uh, Old Knight Ravager. Heather Stepper. Heather Stepper as a deer. It's like Sky Candle. Sky Candle for the sun. What is, what is the one that's in the boat? No, that's metonymy. What do they call the it? The keel. The keel. Any other kennings? So, Alec, what's the definition of a kenning? That's a two word metaphor. Two word metaphor. I was going to say bone cage. Bone cage, bone house, all those sorts of things. Bone lappings for the sinews. Lytotides is a dramatic understatement. We see this at the end of the first stanza in Beowulf with what line? That was a good way. That was one good king. king. And what king were they referring to? Not Beowulf. No, no, no. Uh, Shield? Shield. Sheepson. Shield, Sheepson. Wrecker of meat benches, rampage of foes. That was one good king. When we looked at the second example of Light Totees, where were we? That was a bad place. Who's late? Randall's mother. Randall's mother, the second of three monsters, or was the third monster? Dragon. And how long had Beowulf been king? Fifty How did Beowulf defeat Grendel? Cross his arm. What was the name of the king? Cross the name of the hall. Hero. What was the name of the man who was loyal to Beowulf in the end? Wait, 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 wait. What was the name of the man who lent Beowulf the sword that failed him? What kind of man was on Firth? Jealous. Jealous. Loser, weak, yeah. defamer, defamer of um, Beowulf's name. But in the end, just kind of a mean guy. Swords. What was the name of the guy that Beowulf battled on the open sea? Not really battled, but Brecca. Brecca. Good, yeah. good. He challenged yeah. on the open sea. Um, hmm. Okay, let's move on from Beowulf. Between what two years was Beowulf written? Five hundred. Seven hundred and a thousand. The middle thing, or the old English time period began with what major event? The invasion of... Wait, the middle of The, the fall of Rome. The fall of Rome and the three tribes invading. The three tribes being? The Jews, Saxons, and the Angles. Angles, Saxons, and Jews invade. They are Germanic tribes. What year does William the Conqueror invade? And the 66. Bringing what influence? French. 
So you have French, you have Germanic. Let me ask this question. Old English poetry was characterized specifically by two primary devices. What are they? Alliteration. Sesora or Setra and alliteration. What is the definition of a Setra? A Setra? It's the stop in the middle of a poem. It's the pause in the middle of a line of poetry. Three epic poems other than Beowulf. Andrew. Uh, Canterbury Tales. Epic poems. One. Odyssey. The Odyssey. Oh. The Iliad. And, and the Iliad. The epic hero of the Iliad. Sam. Um, Odysseus? Iliad. No, no, no. Um, Achilles. Achilles of the Odyssey. Odysseus. Odysseus of the Aeneid. Aeneas. 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 Yeah, that one. Just match with the names. And then, of course, you have Beowulf. Definition for Radix Melorum est Cupidus. Greed is the cause of all evil. Greed is the root of all evil. I mean, again, technically it's a love of money, but they just translated this greed. Greed is the root of all evil. What year did Chaucer die? What in what invention ushered in the Renaissance? Grand Press. What year did William Conqueror invade? 1066. And that's really all I have for you from that. What month does um, Canberra Tales April. take place? April. April is when the showers soak oh. after the drought of March. Okay, let me explain what's going to happen next. As I mentioned before, there's always going to be a paper at the end of each class. And what I'm going to do is give you the prompt for the paper, and this is going to lead into next class. Now, I know the Tuesday-Thursday split is a little more difficult than the Thursday-Tuesday. Because with Tuesday-Thursday, you only have two days, basically, and a lot of work to do in that time. The biggest thing is going to be this paper. The paper is three to four pages. It's a regular response to text paper. And you have an option of writing about either Beowulf or Canterbury Tales. With this particular paper, because I'm trying to ease you back into writing after a little time off, I'm giving you two options. There is an unspoken third option that if you want to, you can choose an additional topic that's more interesting to you, as long as it deals specifically in some way with Beowulf or Canterbury Tales. So take a look at the prompt. Write a three-page, double-spaced paper in Times New Roman 12-point font. Include a title. I'm very big on the titles here. It's kind of like the titles uh, that you remember from TED-BT. I want a clever little saying, followed by a colon, followed by the topic, followed by the title. There's the example on here. Dungeons and Dragons, the blending of social commentary and fantasy in Beowulf. It says six citations from the primary text, but down at the bottom it says four. So we're going to go with the lower number since it says both. As long as you have four, you'll be given full credit for citations. Here are your options. Characters who possess heroic qualities often reflect the values and morals of their society. Analyze how Beowulf, or one of the pilgrims from Canterbury Tales, mirrors the values of his or her culture. And then finally, are the characters in Beowulf or Canterbury Tales as psychologically complex as characters in modern literature? If you don't like those two topics, these are just to get you thinking. Come up with a different topic you could write about with regard to Beowulf or Canterbury Tales. And then all you need to do is come up with an argumentative thesis for that topic. This is the typical five paragraph essay format. So you're going to have your introduction, ending a thesis, your three body paragraphs, and your conclusion. Vince. Um, we're going to do the first prompt and write about the, uh, Hardner. Do we say how he doesn't mirror uh, his culture? I suppose you could. Yeah. yeah. Um, with, with the first or second prompt, you may have to do a tiny bit of research um, depending on how you're going to frame your thesis. But type it up, submit it to turnitin.com. Make sure you have the ID and the password. Register for the class. Submit your paper and get your turnitin.com receipt once you submit it. Because if I pull up turnitin.com on Thursday and your paper is not submitted, but you have the turnitin.com receipt, I'll say good. Otherwise, it will be kind of late. I'll be reading them over the weekend, get your comments, get your feedback, and go from there. Point one. Point two. 
these first couple of classes, we're going to be kind of racing through. Did someone already grab a couple of you? Okay. We are going to be looking at two texts next time. You do not need to bring Canterbury Tales or Beowulf. So if you borrowed some from me, make sure you return those today. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you obviously need them for the paper. So hang on to them for that. Um, then, you will not need to bring them to class at all. You already got one. Because we are moving so quickly with our material, we're basically covering one or two books each class period. Let me explain to you my plan here. My vision is, and I don't want to say this in such a way that you're going to take advantage of it, but I don't actually expect you to completely and thoroughly read everything I tell you to read for the next class. Will I be giving you a quiz? Yes, each time. But as long as you have everything read by the final exam, which you can take as late as the first week in August, as long as you have everything read by that, you should be fine. Because everything is so condensed, I'm basically treating this class as if you have read the books, so I'm going to tell you about them and talk to you about them. Take notes, write down all that information, but then also go back and read what you didn't have a chance to read for the final exam, because the final exam is going to be weighted so much for this class. For next time, here's what you need to read from those two works. From Gulliver's Travels, you need to read book one and book two. That's half of Gulliver's Travels. The copy that I gave you is really weird. Every noun is capitalized. And that's going to frustrate you. Why? why? Because that's how it was originally printed. It's an original copy. So this is for this last period? For Thursday. Yeah. And by the way, it doesn't start until page 39. So you're reading book one and book two which is a lot of reading, but I'm telling you, I don't necessarily expect you to completely read all of that. That's going to be 110 pages from here. Okay? Books one and two, and I'll be honest with you, as long as you know what happens in both of those books, you'll be able to keep up with our discussion. Okay? So Gulliver's Travels, books one and two, don't read three and four. Paradise Lost, you are only reading books one, four, and nine. One, four, and nine out of 12 books. Come to class with a strong working knowledge of each of the texts, because we will spend the duration of class talking about these two books. And by the way, once we get done with these books, you will have finished the four probably least interesting books to you. So finish those. You have your writing assignment. If you come to Thursday with your paper submitted, and with the working knowledge of these two books, you'll be in good shape. If you have questions, stick around. Otherwise, I will see you Thursday. We don't have to run our change prompt by you, do we? No. As long as you think it will sufficiently show knowledge of the book, you're fine.